Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. Uh, this episode is episode four of a roundtable series where we're talking about ABR's greatest archaeological discovery, the Mount Ebal Curse Tablet. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist, leader of the excavations at Shiloh, and the president of ABR, Scott Lancer. Now, I want to encourage you to go back, if you haven't seen the previous episodes, to watch episodes one, two, and three as, a, as giving you the context for this episode. And before we begin, I just want to give you a few comments, something we haven't mentioned uh, before in the previous episodes, and that is there was also another theory that's floating out there that the text of the Bible from Deuteronomy through 2 Kings was written by a historian not by Moses and by contemporary authorship, but by a historian called the Deuteronomistic Historian. We'll call him D.H. for short. And uh, this writer purportedly wrote Deuteronomy through 2 Kings uh, during the period of Josiah and later. Uh, that would mean that Moses didn't write Deuteronomy, or most of it, and um, that these events are recorded centuries after the context the Bible puts them in. Now, this tablet discovery that we uh, recently found on Mount Ebal and many other discoveries refute this because uh, the Deuteronomy curse formula that's found in 28 is found on this tablet, which would predate by Josiah's period by at least 500 years. And so this is an example of what we do here at ABR to refute critical theories that go against the scriptures. Now, friends, uh, that was my little monologue to start the show today. Uh, but I want to you want to piggyback off of my little talk there about mm. the DH, the mm -hmm. Deuteronomistic Historian. Say that 10 times without <laughs> stuttering. Uh, you can say something a little easier. We've talked about the documentary hypothesis. And in this episode, we want to emphasize some of the implications of, the, of this find, Scott. So I turn it over to you to send us off in any direction you like. <laughs> Well, it's kind of fun. <clears throat> we have to be so multidisciplinary in what we do, and we have to learn new things every day. So we're dealing about with, with philosophical theories, with, with literature, with language, with material culture, with um, theological truth. So we, we try to be as interdisciplinary in our approach as we can. We also have the documentary hypothesis, and this comes from Wellhausen, of course, out of kind of German skepticism, and uh, within a generation, it really catches on, and others have iter iterations of it, but essentially, there's an argument that we have multiple sources within the text itself that are hundreds of years apart, and they're not compiled or redacted until about a thousand years after Moses was purported to have lived. The, the consequence of this is that we have no eyewitnesses, okay? The, these are merely a te teleological stories that have been woven together into a fabric so that Israel has an ancient heritage, which means the moral claims of the Bible are not binding. Just a is what work, it comes down a work to. of a series <clears throat> of human authors, and that's it. That's it. And the, the J source and the E source that we mentioned earlier were hundreds of years apart, but in the inscription we have them together. That in and of itself is massive, and the consequences of, of, of that are huge because graduates of seminaries that have been trained in this idea that you don't have a reliable historical biblical text, that's profound. And I, I know I was speaking at a church in the Houston area recently and the pastor's a, a brilliant man, a graduate of an Ivy League seminary, and he had been taught all of this documentary hypothesis, and he never could fully trust the text of the Bible. And he heard me speak about this topic, and he came up to me afterward, and he said it was the most liberating day of his life, tears running down his cheeks. He said, are you telling me that Moses wrote the Pentateuch when the Bible says that he wrote it? I said, yes. Are you telling me that the Exodus happened in the 15th century BC? I said, yes, that's what I'm telling you. And the tears were just flowing. He said, 25 years as a pastor, and I couldn't, I couldn't preach those, those portions of scripture with confidence. He said, this is the greatest day of my life. Now, I'm sure he was exaggerating, probably his marriage was a greater day than that, but yeah. it was a liberating yeah. day for him. Amen. And Scott, Henry, multiply that by a thousand. You guys know the emails that we, that we get from people, professors and skeptics and atheists and, and kids and men and women and young and old uh, who are grappling with this idea. 
And the bottom line is this, if the Bible is true, then the God of the Bible holds a moral claim on our lives. And that's not a message that a woke culture is eager to embrace, one that is based on autonomy, and I make my own rules. In fact, that's the whole point of this curse, isn't it? That there are consequences for our actions. Yeah, consequences yes. before yes. God. Scott, your thoughts on, on this, uh, you know, sort of as, a, as the leader of ABR, uh, char given that charge by the Lord, and as a pastor with... Yeah. Uh, I don't want to age you here, Scott, but at least 30 years experience, <laughs> maybe I'll, more. I'll, a little while. <laughs> no, I, uh, my, my uh, great concern is for young people uh, going, especially those going through a theological education, mm. but it, it, because they're the ones that are going to be confronted with these really, really bad paradigms. These paradigms are, are guesswork. They're arguments from silence. They're, but, but they're designed mm. to feed woke culture. We come up with the idea. We criticize the Bible. We're asserting our will against the Bible. And see, some people say, oh, well, that, you know, this is an academic institution. We need to consider all angles. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that. I, I understand the, the, the pursuit of studying all angles. But if you have come to Christ for salvation and you hear the words of Jesus telling you that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, well, who are you going to believe? Your professor? These theories that they've invented out of their own mind? Mm -hmm. Who are you going to believe? That's the question for people. Well, Scott, let me just segue into that because it's not that they want all sides to be heard. Yeah. It's they yeah. want their side to be heard. And we heard this just two days ago when we were at Messiah University. The, these Bible professors weren't saying, here's what one school of thought believes. And here's another school of thought. And let the students and, weigh that. And grapple with, grapple with these two paradigms. No, 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 no. Day one of the semester, Moses could not have possibly written this. Yeah. So that's predatory. That's yeah. not academic freedom. That's not setting out these options and choices and grapple with this like five views on the Exodus, for example. Here's what people believe and grapple with it. No, no. This is I'm out to dismantle your faith. That's wokeism. And this speaks to that also. Yeah, very, very good, gentlemen. Yeah. Very passionate. I, I'm, I'm with you, obviously, all the, all the way, you know. And it appeals to the unsaved mind, that the unsaved mind can sit on the throne and be God. And, we do, and this is what happens with Scripture. If, if we're not born again of the Spirit, there's a blindness that comes over and they do, do this. But the damage is so catastrophic for a young person entering school. Think about an 18, 19-year-old mm -hmm. young person uh, who's grown up in the church and they go out and then they hear this. If they, and that's why our ministry exists in part, to equip the parents, equip the kids, so that when they hear it, they've got answers to these kind of things. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Henry, please go, if Scott. I, yeah, go for it. A lot of times uh, students, they, they're, they're saved and maybe in high school, they have not been given a thorough theological education. They go to a Bible college to get that education. And if the first day they hear, well, yeah, Moses didn't write that. I'm going to contradict Jesus here and uh, listen to me. That's yes. the stuff that's so dangerous. And we want everyone who's watching this episode today to be encouraged to trust the Bible. Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, that's a good word from our uh, leader here at ABR, Scott Lancer. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. 
Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist and friend, mentor, colleague, and Scott Lancer, the president of ABR. We have been talking for three, almost three and a half episodes now about the Mount or, uh, Ebal, excuse me, cursed habit, and we are not yet done. So Scott, we have some, uh, some odds and ends that we skipped mm -hmm. over that we'd like to pick up that are very interesting for the audience. So a little more archeology, span if you will. Let's talk about giant footprints. <laughs> Yeah, people ask, are there, are there giants in Israel? And they Photoshop these images of giant skeletons. People send those to me all the time. Yes. Uh, they're fake. Um, <laughs> but we do have giant footprints. And they're about 400 meters long. And inside the foot-shaped enclosure, there is often another smaller footprint in there that's about 100 meters, or the size of a football field, if you will. So four football fields for the big one, one football field for the smaller one, with an altar inside the smaller one, and an entrance area with sort of a, a dual gate that leads around, that leads to that altar area. So they're very fascinating. So you, you cross from Jericho, and you encounter the first one at a place called Argaman, and uh, many people believe this is Gilgal, by the way. Um, you know, this is, uh, or the Gilgalim, perhaps the campsites uh, of the tribally where the Israelites camped. But these foot-shaped enclosures are very interesting because they're going up the Jordan Valley as if they're going somewhere. <laughs> this is a giant, or you know, you can see this chariots of the gods kind of an idea. Yeah. But clearly they're built by, by people, but people probably driven by a theological purpose. And the final footprint is at Mount Ebal. So you're starting down at, at Argaman, and then you're ending at Mount Ebal. Maybe there's others that haven't been found yet or that have been dismantled over time. But these six are very interesting because you're starting where the conquest begins. You cross the Jordan, and then you're coming to Mount Ebal where this covenant is cut. And that's where the altar is within a foot-shaped enclosure. And so we think back to, the, again, the Abrahamic covenant, which was cut there at El Amore. Wherever your feet touch, I will give you. And then, of course, God tells the Israelites the same thing. You know, where, wherever your feet trod is going to be yours. So it's, I think, again, tapping back into that. How they were able to build these so symmetrically in ancient times is fascinating to me. And these enclosures, Scott, are they walls? Yeah, there, there's a small walls, maybe um, a meter high, three feet or so high. So they're more barriers. They're not... Okay. It's just sort of creating a sacred precinct yeah. that yeah. becomes increasingly more sacred the closer that you, you get in toward the altar. That's fascinating. Go. So yeah. it makes its way up the Jordan Valley. So we'll use our sanctified imag imagination here, as you just alluded to, <laughs> is the idea of taking that text sort of literally. And in the background of this is the Israelites' sojourning in Egypt, right? So now we're in the land. And so we're going to put our stamp on it, almost like is the way that you might interpret it. I mean, we've got to be careful with subjectivity, but... Well, I think you idea? could. In fact, the, the campsites could have been built at the very beginning of the conquest when the Isra, they're at Gilgal for some time, and, you know, we've got a lot of people. You could build these enclosures at that time and say that tribally, each tribe is building its own campsite as a series of footprints as they're moving up the, uh, the Jordan Valley is plausible. Any other precedents in the ancient Near East that you know um, We have some strange structures that we call kites up in, the, um, up in the Galilee, or the Golan rather, that are sort of calcolithic in age, mysterious, kind of the Stonehenge types of, of structures, yeah. the Gobekli Tepe type of structures. But as far as footprints themselves, that, this is a new one on Unique. me. Unique, unique. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right, well, Scott, I, I think it would be helpful for our viewers today to, to understand why in the world is there a cursed tablet found on at Mount Ebal at all? Why, why would the ancients be obsessing over curses? Uh, uh, one, one person uh, said that uh, I think it would be a good idea if you guys put it back. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, yeah. they're thinking of... Uh, We're going to unleash it, yeah. Yes, like there's some kind of mystical evil force or something. 
Well, I've got good news. Um, we, we know how to neutralize the curse. Uh, why, why did we have a curse tablet in the first place? It's because of sin. So Genesis 3 tells us that sin enters the world and God responds with curses. Mm -hmm. There's a curse placed on Adam, a curse on Eve, a curse on, uh, on the earth, a curse on the serpent. But the idea of a curse, they, many people, it runs through their mind that it's some kind of evil person that would do that. Right. Wouldn't a bad person be cursing <laughs> people? Well, think of it as consequence. Um, uh, the, the curse is the negative consequence. When, when you get married, essentially, this is any covenant has positive and negative aspects to it. The, the, it's the oaths. They're sworn with an oath before witnesses. And these are the benefits I'm going to get if I keep this covenant. These are the consequences that are going to happen if I violate the terms of this covenant. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this in my book, The Power of Covenant in the Times of Crisis, which we published just before we discovered the, the tablet, writing about the, the blessings and the curses and how that's integral to forming a biblical covenant. Yeah, so, so it does seem foreign to people today. I guess maybe you could comment on that a little bit. I mean, you know, when we think of that, we think of a shaman cursing somebody. You mentioned that at the right. banquet and that kind of thing. So help them understand how serious it is to be under the curse of God. Maybe we could just say that, and then we'll segue into our last segment. Give them a snippet of your well, thought on that. Think, Jesus sees a fig tree, and it has no fruit on it, and he curses the fig tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's very foreign to our mind. Yes. They go by the next day and the fig trees withered up. It was a metaphor, right? It was a lesson yes. that he was trying to give. Mm -hmm. But can, can people still be under a curse today? Absolutely. Yeah. And that may be foreign to our Western mind, but we better get used to it because it's biblical that there are consequences. Galatians, be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he reaps. So there are consequences for our actions and the Bible calls that a curse. Now, of course, theologically, Jesus becomes a curse for us. Yes. When He dies, He takes a crown of thorns, which is the symbol of the, of the curse, takes it upon Himself. So, I think on a theological level, we've talked about anthropological and archaeological and all kinds of other things, but just bring it down to home for a minute on the theological level, the ramifications are really big. And I think it's a good thing that people are grappling with this. Amen to that. Well, friends, we're going to be coming back for our final segment of our four-part episode on the Mount Ebal Curse Tab. We're going to be talking about Jesus and how you can be um, saved from the curse of God. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Uh, you are finishing now a journey with us over four episodes as we've talked about the Mount Ebal curse tablet. And uh, in this final segment, we're going to be talking about the theological ramifications. So, Scott, uh, the curse tablet found in an altar on the Mount of Cursing. Let's talk about theology and the richness of that picture. Okay, well, Remember, Henry, that most of these tablets that have been found are very petty sorts of curses. They're amulets. Um, they're, they're invoking some, some curse on somebody who's stole something from me or messed up my property or whatever. It's very self-serving. That's not what this is. This is a very global and over, overarching. Cursed are you by the God Yahweh. This is the whole nation being bound together under an oath. And it's really a big problem. It's kind of the same problem Abraham had right there at El Amore when he cut the Abrahamic covenant. Walk before me and be perfect all the days of your life. And now you're supposed to walk through the blood to enact this covenant. Abram's a mess, okay? He's not going to be able to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as he, his feet touch this blood, he's in big trouble, just like we would be. And the fact is that Everyone listening to us today, ourselves included, we have all broken God's law. 
And that curse then inures to us, and it's a curse by Yahweh. It's not like by the devil. Right. I mean, this right. is checkmate. When Yahweh has you under a curse, it's checkmate. You cannot get out. There's only one way to get out, and this is the symbolism. And so, as you said, the, the tablet comes from the altar matrix of where that earlier round altar, Joshua's altar is. And so, just picture this. The, the Ark of the Covenant is there. The people are there. Joshua has written the words of the law on these plastered stones. And now, this text has been written on this tablet. Once it's sealed, it becomes binding. It's now a judicially binding legal document. No way to open it. No way to open it. And now, and Moses said, I call heaven and earth as the witnesses. And, and now this tablet is placed on the altar. Now we've got sacrifice of innocent animals, the shedding of innocent blood to cover the guilty. And when this blood goes out, the blood covers the curse and takes it away. So without that, every one of us would be dead. Right. And so right. the only people who the curse inures to are those who will not accept the consequences. They won't own up to their actions. Right. If we'll own up to our actions, we're freed from the curse through the power of the blood, Leviticus 17, 11, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Today, people want to rush to Mount Gerizim and want the blessings of God. But in reality, they need to rush to Mount Ebal right. and receive that curse, if you will. Mm. Hear it, receive it. You're making a promise that you will obey God, but you know that you will not have the power to keep it completely. And so you, you walk through the blood, if you will. You, that's very, very important. You can't skip Mount Ebal. You can't skip it. Right. You don't get to Mount Gerizim until you go yes. to Mount Ebal. Yep. And then you get into the place of the blessing, yep. which is a wonderful thing. You know, we've always wanted to be known for the blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it wasn't a blessing tablet that we found. It was a curse tablet. Yes. And I think it's an even more powerful message because it deals yep. with, you know, the most basic of all problems. You can go all around the world. We spoke at a university this week. I was at the University of Utah recently speaking there. You'll find there's a universal issue with which people have to deal, and it's sin. Yes. And we've not yet, we've, we've gone to the bottom of the ocean, we've gone into outer space and explored galaxies, but we've not yet conquered this sin problem. And this, this tablet's a, a powerful reminder to us that through the power of the blood, the curse can be broken. And so no one watching us today needs to be under a curse. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is repent. Yes. Yep. Turn away from their sins, repent, and the power of the curse is broken through Jesus Christ. Then they can hang out on Mount Gerizim all they want. That's exactly right. I would say, too, they have to repent of the, the wokeness out there because that feeds your self-centeredness. It, it, it allows you to be God, and, and you, God wants to break all mm. of that. So we, we have to come honestly before God. Uh, as Jesus said, walk out into the light so your deeds will be seen for what they are. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the passages are dripping. I'm sure our audience who've, who've read their Bible, you know, that are maybe not newer Christians, but are familiar with the text, or even new, new Christians, you know, cursed is the man who is hung on a tree, Yeah. yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, we're thinking about the Israelites going there as an act of faith, that the efficacy of the, of the blood mm. is sufficient to remit, uh, for the remission of sin, but that's temporary. That's yeah. a temporary, uh, in other words, God has a permanent provision available that's yes. foreshadowed there, yeah. right, in the, in, the, in the death of Christ. This is the book of Hebrews is all about. I mean, it's just dripping with this. With this. But, the, but the act of faith is still there. Mm. For the Israelite, it was that the, that the sacrifice on the altar was sufficient to restore to God, uh, but they had to keep doing it over and over again. And so that's the remarkable picture. Scott, since you have been the leader of this remarkable expedition and discovery. I would love to give you the final word here in talking about our Lord Jesus and the ramifications yes. of the gospel as it relates to the curse. When I sat there at that place, I had a, a great sense that we would have an opportunity to make something very important known to the world. I'm grateful on a personal level that God conquered me in my rebellion he neutralized me in my sin through the power of the blood and uh, overcame that. 
And for those who are watching today, it's our hope that they'll take the archaeological evidence and they'll seriously consider it and the ram ramifications of that. Anyone who's living less than the life that God wants them to live, they're still under a curse. It doesn't have to be that way. It's an act of repentance, turning away and turning to Jesus and then to enter into a great life of blessing. And so we're grateful that we were able to make this discovery and now to make it known to the world. Scott, thank you for everything that you do. And Scott, thank you for everything you do. This has been a wonderful time together. Friends, thank you for joining us for these four episodes. As Dr. Stripling shared with you, that Jesus is the solution to the curse. We cannot break the curse on our own. He has done it for us through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. And we are so grateful uh, for that. And we hope that you will embrace this truth today. Thank you for watching Digging for Truth.